<laughs> do you drive yet? No. Uh, we need an extra piano player. <laughs> so you can make your way up there to Columbus. Amen. Our two piano players, the one lady, she has four children. And the other lady, she has one child, and he acts like four children. So uh, we're stuck with me playing the guitar up there trying to carry a tune, and it's just the Lord, he, he's mer merciful to us. Amen. But good to see you all tonight. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in Psalms 101. You can start turning there. I, oh, I have one back there in my seat. I forgot to bring it up. You could. You got a green light. So we're good on that end. But uh, good to see you all. Um, thank you for praying for us, supporting us. And uh, I'll give you a real quick update while you're turning over there. Psalms 101. Uh, you, you all were praying that we find a building to meet in, and we did find a building. <coughs> it's a Church of Christ. And. Uh, Long story short, I'm sorry, I did bring it up here. My memory ain't what it used to be. <laughs> I'm sorry. I got my Bible, I got my notes, that's all I need from here on out. Uh, Don't be nervous, bro. Anyway, I am, I am, believe it or not, I am so nervous. Uh, but uh, anyway, we're meeting We're meeting right now on Saturdays at a Church of Christ. Uh, I called, uh, called, emailed, visited in person uh, over 20 different churches. And a lot of them said we can't let you meet in our place on Sundays afternoons because we already have one to two other churches that we let use our building. A lot of churches now are renting out their building on Sunday afternoons. No one has Sunday afternoon services anymore or Sunday evening. So they'll let a new church uh, use their building on Sunday afternoons, which is good in one sense, bad in another. It's bad because we couldn't get in to some of them. And uh, good in the sense of, you know, that's pretty common right now. Um, a lot of churches are doing that. They're just using another church's building. It's a lot cheaper than renting your own place or buying your own place. So we're just kind of saving up money right now uh, as a church. That's not a sin. Right. Amen. You're allowed to save money up for, <laughs> for things. And, uh, you know, we're not blowing our money on a bunch of uh, things we don't need. We're using it for evangelistic efforts, you know, song books, hymnals, um, things like that, uh, Bibles. Uh, we're, we have any, uh, we're going to start meeting here in, in the next month at a place. It's a senior living apartment complex in kind of a lower income area. And they have two, it's a five story, 200 and some apartment complex. And we're going to start meeting up there on Saturday afternoons to have a Bible study with them. So some of the money will go to, towards the Bibles for that. We have a little paperback hymnal we're going to take there. But we're saving up money. We're wanting, I'd like to, instead of start renting our own place, I'd like to just be able to buy in the next year or two of the Lord to be willing um, but yeah, we're meeting there at the Church of, at the Church of Christ on Saturday morning, 10 and 11 a.m. We're the Seventh Day Church of Christ Baptist. <laughs> and, uh, we pretty much believe the same thing. We believe in the Sabbath, and we believe that you should keep it holy in the Old Testament. Uh, we believe in water baptism. We do that too. We just don't believe saved. Amen. It's so pretty much the same, or similar. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, if you all have a free Saturday morning, come up and see us. And, uh, but yeah, they, they've been a blessing to us. They've you know, rolled out the carpet for us. Uh, still haven't had hardly any Baptist churches ever give me a call back. Um, but the Church of Christ and the Full Gospel Churches are helping us out. So we'll take it anywhere we can get it. But, um, so thank you all for praying for that and uh, your support. Uh, my wife, you know, keep praying for us. She's pregnant. Got another one on the way due in July. Baby number two. And uh, we just moved out there to the east side of Columbus. And, um, just bought a dog last night, a puppy. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I can do all this. But we just got a puppy, baby on the way, starting the church. You know, why not? And all my free time I got, why not get a puppy? So anyways, I ain't going to tell you what kind, or else you all think I was a yuppie. But um, anyways, uh, I think that's everything. I was going to update you on. But, uh, thank no, you. Tell us what kind of dog you got. It's being recorded. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's a golden doodle. Golden Doodle, y'all heard of that? It's kind of a yuppie dog, very popular. It's a crossbreed between a golden retriever and a poodle, and it ends up getting the best genes out of both of them. It's usually a lot healthier. It, those dogs are both healthy. It's a lot healthier. It doesn't shed hardly at all, if any. Um, it's you know real smart, playful, and all that. But it's, I, I, I don't like the idea of a poodle. I don't believe a man will have a poodle and all God's people said I told my wife we're not doing any bows or nothing like that. I'm not walking a little pink bowed poodle out there. But uh, anyways, it's a golden doodle. It's not a poodle. It's a golden doodle. So it's got golden retriever in it. But anyways, uh, we're having a good time. I've been enjoying life, enjoying the things of God, serving the Lord. I'm going to stop serving the Lord. Uh, we're still witnessing the folks up there in Columbus, getting the word of God out. We're trying to build our YouTube ministry, Facebook ministry. Uh, we'll start door-to-door door back in the spring. We've got this evangelistic effort going there at the apartments, just doing what little we can. And we, uh, we support one missionary, amen, Brother Yoko. 
started supporting him last year, and Amen. so uh, just having a good time. Amen. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are always setbacks, but uh, usually a setback is a set up you know, for something good. So Psalms 101, if you're there, say amen. Amen. Yeah. And then I want to give you all something that uh, the Lord gave me back on January 1st of this year, actually. And I don't know if it's more of a lesson, a message, a devotional, I don't know what you'd call it, or what, but I hope it helps you. It's helped our people, and I'm going to try and give it to you tonight. And uh, I want you to bear with me. Um, I want you to bear with me whenever we get into it. It may sound a little different than maybe what you're used to, I don't know, but just bear with me. I'll keep an open mind about it. Um, but it may be a different spin on this, this subject than what you've heard before. But Psalms 101, Psalm 101, verse number 1. David said, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso curtly slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within mine house, and he that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked. Amen. Don't you love this? This is a song. Amen. Yes. This is a song they got to sing. Could you imagine if we got to sing that? Amen. I will destroy the wicked. Amen. Let's just sing the chorus. I will destroy the wicked. I love it. Just go around singing that in the streets. Amen. But again, you got to get your Bible right doctrinally. Uh, I will destroy all the wicked of the land that I may cut off all the wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, just for the people that are here tonight. God, I pray, Lord, I know they didn't come to hear me. I know they didn't come to hear a man. But, Lord, I believe they came, Lord, out of duty. I believe they came, Lord, out of love. And, God, I pray, Lord, that you would give them something tonight. I don't know what they walked in with. I don't know what burdens they walked in with, what troubles, what worries, sorrows, heartaches, fears. And, God, I don't know maybe if there's sin that they walked in with, Lord, that all that, Lord, needs to be taken to you. And God, I pray, Lord, that they would hear from you tonight, God, and get something from the simple lesson here, Lord, the simple message, God, that would make their year, Lord, different and their life different, I pray. Thank you, God, that I'm still nervous to do this great work, Lord, of preaching. I pray, God, that you would convict hearts, Lord, reprove, rebuke, and exhort, Lord, in a way that I can. And Lord, we'll be sure to give you all the glory, honor, and praise for us. In Christ's name, we ask these things. And amen. 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 Just by way of introduction here, and I'll give you my thought or what I want to talk about, but this time of the year, it's the end of January, I believe it's January 29th, 2023, did I get that part right? Yes. Okay. And I'm in Hillsborough, Ohio. Uh, I didn't take my medicine again today, so I'm off a little bit, amen. But uh, anyways, this time of the year, most people are making New Year's resolutions in January. New Year's resolutions, and I don't know if y'all remember this or not, but I still don't really care for New Year's resolutions. They don't, yeah. they don't mean nothing to me. But be, but be honest, it's a safe space here. How many of y'all made New Year's resolution this year? It's fine if you did. I have one back there. My wife did. You did. You made a New Year's resolution. Amen. Uh, no one else made one? What's message? I need a different message tonight. This ain't going to work. <laughs> most people make New Year's resolutions at the beginning of the year. And uh, the truth is that most people quit on them by the first month of the year. They're done by January. I think it's 20th. They gave up on their New Year's resolution. Are you still keeping your New Year's resolution? You have? Good. Have you kept it, honey? She hasn't even told me what hers is because she knows how I feel about them. But <laughs> most people give up on their New Year's resolutions. And uh, the idea is they're going to change something in their life to make their life better. And the most popular resolutions in 2022 were living healthier, personal improvement, happiness, and losing weight. Those were the top three New Year's resolutions. Uh, something I found interesting about New Year's resolutions is that baby boomers wanted to lose more weight than other generations and are less concerned about saving money. Than other generations. I thought that was interesting. Uh, I thought it was interesting that millennials are most confident in keeping their New Year's resolutions. Mm. I thought that's fitting because millennials are confident in everything that they do. I mean, they're overconfident. Generation Z, I don't even know what generation that is, but I think it's younger than me. Generation Z, they said, was four times more likely to make a New Year's resolution that involved finding the love of their life. Generation Z said, hey, I want this year's going to be the year that I'm going to find the love of my life. They were four times more likely than any other generation to have that goal for their year. And I was thinking, that makes sense because I feel bad for folks trying to find husbands and wives right now. Because yeah. you don't know if a guy's a guy or if a girl's a girl. It would be hard to, you know, to find one. So I, I see why they're a little more worried about it. I found that uh, they said southern states, a lot of people in the southern states, their New Year's resolution uh, was different than the people in the east or the northern, the northern states. 
the northern states were more likely to make a New Year's resolution to stop drinking alcohol completely. In the north, they said, we were, we're going to stop drinking alcohol completely. The south was more likely to say, we will cut back on the alcohol <laughs> that we drink. Which I thought that was interesting. I guess the south was saying, hey, let's not go all the way. But it was interesting. They gave four reasons as to why people don't keep their New Year's resolutions. They gave four reasons as to why people don't keep their New, their New Year's resolutions. Uh, they said, number one, 33% of participants <laughs> failed to keep track of their progress. They didn't keep track of whether or not they were making any progress towards their goals. Secondly, they said 23% forgot about the resolutions <laughs> and what they were. That's probably why a lot of you in here don't make New Year's resolutions, because yeah. even if you did make them, you probably forgot by now. Yeah. And they said about 1 in 10 people who failed their New Year's resolutions said they made too many. Said they made too many resolutions. And fourthly, this was the one I, found, I thought was interesting. They found a study of New Year's resolution people that, that have them. They said 35% of those people failed to keep their New Year's resolutions because they had unrealistic goals. They had unrealistic goals. The goals that they were trying to make for that year were just simply unrealistic. And I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, you know, you, you think of what people's New Year's resolutions are a lot of times. A lot of times they'll say something, and the whole time I'm thinking, you know, why are you going to change something that's been that way for years? You know, people always have this New Year's resolution, I'm going to be skinny this year. And my thought is, it's like, you know, hey, you've been fat for 40 years. Why not just keep going? Amen? I mean, you've been faithful in it. You've been good at it. You're still alive. You're still thriving. I mean, just keep going. Why change now? Hey, you've been in it too long. Amen? They said, I'm going to be skinny now after 50 years of being fat. No, just keep going. Don't, don't make an unrealistic goal. Amen. People say, I'm not going to be poor this year. I'm going to start saving money. And I'm thinking, you've been poor for 30 years. Why change now? You're not going to start saving money this year. You're not going to spend money any better. Just keep going on what you're doing. But you, you, I'm just joking with you. But the idea is that people have these goals. I'm going to save all this money. I'm going to go and travel the world this year. And then they don't achieve those goals. Yeah. And they get down on themselves because they think, man, I just didn't do it. I didn't keep my resolution. I wasn't true to myself. I wasn't true to my own word. I failed in this thing. Because they have an expectation that's too high for them to achieve. Yeah. It's an unrealistic goal. And folks, I'll tell you this. A lot of times you and I set unrealistic goals for ourselves. A lot of times in our lives, we have unrealistic goals of what we should be achieving spiritually for the Lord, yeah. of what we should be doing financially, of how we should be performing as parents, grandparents, spouses, children, brothers and sisters, how we should be performing for the Lord. We have this expectation of ourselves that's too high. Yeah. And a lot of times we don't meet that expectation. We don't meet that standard. And because of that, our mind begins to think, man, I'm not good enough. Yeah. I'm not good enough. Yeah. I'm not a good enough spouse, I'm not a good enough husband, a good enough wife, I'm not a good enough employer or an employee, I'm not good enough at, at making money, I'm not good enough at witnessing, I'm not good enough at giving tithes and offerings, I'm not good enough at this or that, because we have an expectation of ourselves that's too high. We have expectations that are too high for other people. A lot of times we, demand, we think too much of our employers. We think our employers are supposed to always be good and be right and be just, and we have these expectations of our co-workers and people around us, the brethren. A lot of times our frustrations with other people is, this, is, is because of we think that they should act a certain way, meet a certain standard, and if they don't meet that, we get frustrated with them. Yeah. And we forget that all that they are is just a bunch of dirt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know the best way to get dirt to stay together? You ever made a sandcastle or went out in the mud and played? Is to get water and then mold that mud together. And you know that's what God did with us? Yeah. He said, I can't make this dust do anything. I need to... I need to get some fluid into its body, and that'll actually hold it together. And all that you and I are just animated dust balls. Yeah. Yeah. And yet we get these expectations of ourselves, of other people, and because that we, we get to this routine of thinking that we're not good enough, we're not good enough. I'm gonna, if, I, if you don't get anything else from this, get this. That is not God's will for your and I's life. Right. That is not God's will for you to always feel like you're not performing well enough, you're not doing well enough, your church is not growing fast enough, your ministry is not growing fast enough, your family is not religious enough or spiritual enough. That's not God's will for your life and my life. And this idea of having an unrealistic goal, I think a lot of times it's because we have expectations that are not our own, they're not, they're, or they are our own, they're our own standard, our own perspective on the situation, on the person. Instead of getting God's standard, God's expectation of ourselves and other people, if we would get God's standard, we'd realize that more often than what we know, we meet that standard. And I'm going to prove that to you from the Word of God. But well, a lot of times we do meet God's standard of what He wants in our life, but we just we got this idea because the world, by the way, is one that brought that in. The world, by watching all the television and TV commercials, the reason why you think you don't look the way you should look and you're not as skinny and as muscular as what you think you should be or have the body you think you should have as a woman is because you're watching women on TV. Yeah. And you think that you're supposed to look that way. Yeah. 
You're watching men on TV and you think that you're supposed to look that way. Women, you're watching other men on TV that look a certain way and then you look at your husband and say he doesn't look the way that they look. And you don't even know that you're subconsciously beginning to think that way. Right. You see these nice houses, you see the nice car they're driving down the road, you know, and what's his name in there driving, the, you know, the Lincoln, what's his name? That actor? Uh, Matthew McConaughey. He's a little bit, uh, uh, talking to himself and you think, man, I need a new Lincoln. You think your car is not good enough? You think your boat isn't fast enough? You think your, your house isn't big enough? And what it is, is it's making you try to meet this expectation, this standard that God didn't put on you and I. Right. The world put that on us. Yeah. And uh, So back to Psalms 101, I want to bring this back to this idea. You know what Psalms 101 is? It's David making a whole bunch of resolutions. Yeah. Think about it. Look what he says. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. He's making a resolution. The same way someone says, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to tithe more, I'm going to give more, I'm going to make more money. He's making a New Year's resolution. I will behave myself wisely. I will set no wicked thing before my eye. He said, I will hate a forward heart. He's just making resolution after resolution after resolution. You realize that's all that the Bible is, just people that made a whole bunch of resolutions in their life? Yeah. I will not look upon a handmaid. I will sing I will sing it into thy praises. Paul, it's a person saying, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to stop doing this. They're just making resolutions. Yeah. They're making resolutions. And this, this resolution is what I want you to get. Look at this resolution that David had. This was his expectation of himself. Think of this. Look down in verse number two. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Look down that same verse. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Mine eyes, verse number six. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful land that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way. He shall serve me. You know what David's expectations were for himself and those that are going to walk beside him? It was for them to be perfect. perfect. That was his resolution. Yeah. He said, I'm going to be perfect. And every, did he say He said everything, right? He said, I walk through my house with a perfect heart. I'll behave, behave myself wisely in a perfect way. And he says, those that walk in a perfect way, they will be the one to serve me. His expectation for himself, his goal, his New Year's resolution, if you will, was that I'm going to be perfect and those around me are going to be perfect. Yeah. Ain't that a real high expectation? Right. When you talk about expectations you can't reach, that you can't, that you can't fulfill, and yet David's saying, that's what I'm going to do. Well, let me ask you this. Did he achieve it? Nope. Well, y'all got ahead of me, but I want to prove you wrong. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. I got a hold of this, folks, and you're, we're going to see a couple of people in the Bible that are perfect. First Kings chapter 11, I got a hold of this on New Year's Day, and my mother-in-law was there at the house. She came over for breakfast, and Stephen and my wife were in the other room with her, and I was in my office. First Kings chapter 11, and uh, I had myself a little small shouting spell thinking of this idea of perfection. David prayed that prayer. I don't know how I got to Psalm 101, but David prayed that prayer. I want to be perfect, and I thought, man, what the world knew? No, he wasn't perfect. But then the Lord laid this on my heart. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 11. If you're there, say amen. 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 Look down at verse number 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, the Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go in unto them, or into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. You know, I never got to think of this, but I'll just throw this in there because I just thought about it today. You ever wonder how many children Solomon had? A thousand women? At least had a couple thousand. If you think of two kids per woman, at least had a couple thousand. He probably had more than that with each woman. You know, I got to think of it. It's kind of sad, but think of how he, he didn't have time for all of his kids. And then I got to wonder, and I wonder if the book of Proverbs is something they copied. It says that the men copied it. I wonder if they copied it and gave it to his children to read because he didn't have time to advise his sons. Yeah. And that was the wisdom they got from Solomon. That's just a thought for it. That's nothing to do with the message, but I just thought of it today. But let's keep reading here. Back to David being perfect. Verse number four. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the, <laughs> the heart of David his father. <laughs> Look down verse 5 and 6. For the Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the god of the Zidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. And I got to thinking of that. David prayed, I'm going to be perfect. And you know what the Lord said about David? He was perfect. 
Well, can I ask you a question? Would you, would you call a man that committed adultery with a woman and then lied, had her husband murdered in battle, a great soldier, <laughs> a, great, a great man, Uriah the Hittite, and lies about that, would you call a man perfect? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Would you call a man perfect that doesn't raise his children right, and one of them tries to take the kingdom from him, one of them rapes his sister, uh, one of them tries, one of them kills his brother, uh, one of them, Adonijah, back in uh, 2 Kings, I believe it is, or 1 Kings 1, I forget which one it is there, Adonijah, one of his sons tries to take the throne and sneak in there, and then Bathsheba comes and says, David, weren't you going to make Solomon the king, and David has to tell uh, Adonijah all that. I mean, you talk about a broken family, yeah. a broken home, and one of his sons rapes his stepsister. And the other son murders him. The other son, and that son actually tries to take over the kingdom from him and, and kill David. I mean, would you call a man like that perfect? I wouldn't. But God does. Yep. God calls him perfect. See, if we're going to get this idea of perfection down, we've got to understand that perfection is not what you and I think. Get this. Write this down if you can. Perfection does not mean flawless. Right. Perfection in God's eyes does not mean flawless. It doesn't mean that a person doesn't mess up. It doesn't mean that a person doesn't have flaws. It, that's not what perfection means. Perfection does not mean flawless. Now, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. The idea is, why did God say that David was perfect but not Solomon? He said that Solomon, was not, his heart was not perfect with uh, the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. I'll give you this reason because I want you to get this idea. You and I can, in God's eyes, be perfect. And we can know that we're perfect. But we have to have God's definition of it. Why was David perfect and not Solomon? Um, let me give you another guy. Turn over to Genesis chapter number, I believe it's Genesis 6. Let me give you another one. Genesis chapter number 6. Yeah. I believe he's over here. Yeah, Genesis 6. There's another guy. He was a bass fisher, right? And then he built a, lot, he built a big old boat. <laughs> Genesis 6, verse number 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9. Genesis 6, 9. These are the generations of Noah... Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Noah was perfect before God. You know, Noah gets drunk, and his son sees him naked, yeah. and God curses his grandson because of it. Yeah. Noah convinces seven people to believe in God. He preached for 120 years, and he only convinced seven people to believe him. You know what God says about Noah? That guy got drunk and the sun sees him and God curses his grandchildren. He says, that man's perfect. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but that kind of made me mad whenever I read it. Because <clears throat> I thought, Lord, a drunk? Lord, a guy that commits adultery and murder and everything else, his whole family, and that guy, you're saying that guy's perfect? That dude's perfect? Sorry, King David. Uh, but, you know, that guy's perfect? And God says, yeah, they're perfect. You know, our perspective of perfection is different than God's perspective. Yep. Yeah. And I'll give you reasons why here in just a second. But the thing I want you to get is this. The Bible says that in, in Romans chapter 12, the Bible says, uh, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Mm -hmm. And be not conform to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The idea is this, is that God wants a perfect sacrifice. That's back in the Old Testament. Bring me a sacrifice without blemish, without spot, without anything. Bring me a perfect sacrifice. It says over in Leviticus, and it says, if you bring me a perfect sacrifice, it will be accepted by me. And then God tells us in the New Testament, I no longer want a dead sacrifice. I want a living sacrifice. I want life. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, church, just to throw this in there, don't complicate it beyond that. God wants you to live. Right. And just stop there. Because what you'll do is you'll start complicating it. God does not want your life complicated. He just wants you to live. Right. And that's what he wants. He wants your life a living sacrifice unto him. And if he tells you to offer that to him, and he tells you that he wants it to be perfect, why is it that you get in your head or I get in my head that, man, I'm just not good enough? I'm not doing enough for the Lord. My, my ministry isn't good enough. My, my witness isn't good enough. Why do we get that in our heads? It's because we have a misconception of this idea of perfection. Jesus Christ told us in Matthew 5, Be therefore perfect as your Father, which all, and in heaven is perfect. Turn over to Philippians chapter number 3. Turn over to Philippians chapter number 3. David was perfect. Uh, Noah was perfect. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. I told you to stay with me on this. I said it will, I believe it will help you if you get this idea down. Philippians chapter number 3. Wouldn't you like to be perfect? Yeah. I would. Wouldn't you like to, for other people to think your life's perfect? Seriously, be honest. Wouldn't you like for people to look at your life and say, man, they have a perfect life? That's what social media is for. 
to trick people into thinking that your life's perfect. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> Just put all the good stuff on there. Yeah. You know what people do on social media? They act like they're somebody they're not. And they act like their family something that's not. Right. They want people to think that their life is perfect. Wouldn't you love to have the perfect service to the Lord? Wouldn't you like whenever you get to heaven for God to say you are perfect down there on earth? I do. Yeah. Wouldn't you like this church to be perfect? Yes. Wouldn't you like to say that I go to the perfect church? I know the joke, you know, if you find a perfect church, don't go there, because once you go there, it won't be perfect anymore. But <laughs> wouldn't you like it, though, if this church was perfect? Yeah. Wouldn't you like it to be a walk out of service night and go, man, that was perfect. That's perfect. Just what I needed. You know what was interesting today? I bet this, I don't know this to be true, but I just, I know how human nature is. I know how church goes. I bet you this happened today after you all had the great service you had, the, the teaching, the preaching, the singing, the fellowship together, the food downstairs, the tournaments, the laughing, all that stuff, the laughing, the crying, the prayer, the praise, all that stuff. I bet you people walked out that door and I bet you one person thought, man, that chili, it just wasn't very good. <laughs> and I bet you someone else walked out and said, that was perfect. That was pretty good. Yeah. Someone walked out and said, that preaching was just too loud. And someone else said, you know, that preaching really helped me. I bet you, man, there were people that walked out of there. And to some people, man, they were discontent with what happened. They were mad about what happened. They didn't like something or the way that something was. The, the lights were too dim or they were too bright. The, the painting was too white. It was too dim. They didn't like the things over the windows. They didn't like the seats. They didn't like the pews. The pews were too soft or too hard on their lumbar support. Man, the, the, in the preacher, he probably preached too long or too short for some people. He's probably too loud or too quiet. I bet you there were just things that they just thought, man, that just it didn't go good. And the other people walked out and said, man, that was a good service. So what's the difference? They, they were in the same place. They heard the same thing. They ate the same food. They were around the same people. And yet one walks out and they're mad and discontent. And one walks out and they're happy. And folks, I'm telling you, it's about your perception of things. It's about whether or not you have a grateful heart towards God and a thankful heart towards God. And you realize that God doesn't, he, what he expects of you and I. And whenever you realize what that you can meet that standard, it'll give you liberty. Right. Because I know this to be true. There are a lot of Christians in Bible-believing churches. And because we try to get away from this you know, liberal, ooey-gooey, you know, kissy modern day church where it's all like, hey man, Jesus loves you, bro. <laughs> Dude. Jesus loves you, man. And we try to get away from that. Yeah. Because the preacher gets up there and he's got his little, you know, V-neck and his chest hair's popping out. He's got a spray tan on and, you know, he's got his little flip-flops on. He goes, hey, Jesus loves you, buddy Jeff. <laughs> give, me, hey, give me the rock on that one, man. <laughs> yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. We try to get away from that for so long and Joel Osteen. I'm just so thankful to have you here. And then his wife, Victoria, I'm trying to say we're so thankful to have you. We try to get away from that for so long. Yeah. <laughs> that ooey gooey, mushy stuff. And, and I, we yeah. try to get away from that. We forget that uh, we forget that sometimes God does say that this person, I, I accept them, I accept what they're doing. Right. Sometimes God does say that what they're doing in their life, that's why I told you, I said, get be have an open mind about this thing. I don't want you to think I'm some liberal preacher, but I'll say this. You'd be surprised at what God accepts and what he doesn't accept. Yeah. And it is liberating, and we have a lot, what I was getting at was we have a lot of people in our church, remember, they just live in a state of frustration and spiritual discontentment. They feel like they haven't done enough for the Lord. They, they, their, their church isn't as good enough for the Lord as what they want it to be, and just all these different things. Instead of just saying, hey, I'm going to enjoy my church. Right. I'm going to enjoy my life. I'm gonna, I've, and, and to understand that the Bible says that ye are complete in Him. Yeah. You know what the world does to our young people? It robs them of that sense of completeness. The idea that in God's eyes they're perfect. The idea that in God's eyes they're a beautiful being with purpose and there's hope for their life and there's a, there's a will for their life. And the world says, no, you need to look prettier. You need to look fat. You need to look stronger. You need to be more athletic. You need to make more money. You need to get more degrees. You need to be able to do this and do that. Instead of just saying, no, God accepts you the way that you are. Yeah. God loved you. He died for you the way that you are. You didn't have to get cleaned up to come to Jesus Christ. He came to you the way that you were. Yeah. And all that He wants to do is to make your life better. He wants to make your heart whole, your mind whole. He wants to give you peace. And the world tries to take that from the children. And they think they've got to live up to the some high expectation that the world right. puts on them. Yeah. And I'm telling you tonight, young people, old people, middle-aged people, whatever generation you're from, you can feel accepted in God's eyes. Yes. You say, Aaron, well, why did, and get back to David and Noah. Why did God say that those two men are perfect? And I give you other men in the Bible. Here's your homework for you. And uh, find other people in the Bible that God said were perfect and try and figure out why. But I got to thinking about it. Why would God say that David was perfect and Solomon wasn't? And I'm just going to give this to you because I want you to realize that you can be perfect in God's eyes if you do what they did. And I got to think about why God said David was perfect. 
Solomon has a thousand wives. And I don't know if you know anything about wives, but they require a lot of your time. Amen? <laughs> they require your time. Now, I've never had two or three at once, but somehow Solomon had a thousand women. He had princesses and concubines. I've been offended, man. That be, some of them are called princesses, but I was a concubine. I've been mad. I said, I want the title of a princess. But anyways, he had wives, princesses, concubines. He had a thousand women there. And, uh, but the Bible says that his heart went after those gods. What happened was that Solomon had something in his life. He committed spiritual adultery, uh, adultery, where he went after something, and those women began to take up his time, his thoughts, his energy, his focus. And those women, hey, Brother Frank taught him this year ago, and I still remember him saying this, he ends up spending 13 years, I believe it is, Brother Frank, on his house, Solomon's own house. He spent 13 years building his own house. Yeah. If you're going to have a thousand women in it, you want a lot of man caves. Amen. <laughs> and uh, he spent 13 years building his own house. And seven for the Lord. You want to know why he took all that time to build that house? His heart was after those women. His heart was after their gods. And his heart began to go away after those other gods because he wanted to get, be on their good sides. He wanted to please those women. And what it was was Solomon started walking after the flesh. And he started walking toward that flesh. And he got further and further away from God. And I got to think about David, but David slipped up. David stumbled. But get this. David, throughout the majority of his life, did not stray away from God. Solomon spent hours, days, months, years out of the will of God. His job was more important to him of being a king rather than being a father. His, uh, the, the women were more important to him. He did, that was just his thing that he loved. And he spent the majority of his time just walking after the flesh. The Bible says, walking after the flesh, and you shall uh, fulfill the lust of the spirit. David would stumble. You know what David did whenever he stumbled and committed adultery? And then murder. He repented. And he got back up. And he kept walking after the Lord. This is what I want you to get. The majority of David's life overall was spent towards pleasing God. Yes. And why that's so valuable to you and I is this. If I ask you to say, was your service for the Lord last year in 2022, was it perfect? You'd probably say, no. I messed up. I didn't, you know, I wanted to see 10 people saved, and I only saw one, or I wanted to give, you know, I wanted to do this for the Lord, or do that for the Lord. I want to pick up an instrument, or I want to do this. And you'd probably say, no, my service last year wasn't perfect. Let me ask you this. Were you faithful all throughout last year? Are you still here today? And that means all throughout last year, you were faithful to God like David was. Can I ask this question? Some of you have been in church for longer than I've been alive, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And if I ask you to look over your life and say, was your life to God perfect? You say, no, Aaron, I made mistakes. I didn't ask you that. You say, Aaron, no, I had flaws throughout my ministry. My time served the Lord. I didn't ask you that. I said, overall, right now, on January 29th, 2023, are you still trying to please God? Yeah then you're not like Solomon walking after your flesh. You may give in every now and again like David did and stumble. You may, you may step into sin. You may fall down into sin. But David got back up and went after the Lord. And that tells me that you and I can be perfect if we're willing over our overall life. The overall goal is to bring God glory. You and I can be perfect in our lives. Right. Like David was. Good. And I can give you more. I mean, you, you talk about Jonah there, or Noah. <coughs> Noah says he was a perfect and just man. I'll give you three reasons why I think he was perfect. Uh, number one, he was faithful regardless of the results. Yeah. Amen. He only convinced seven people to get on the boat with him. Right. Plus him was eight. And, uh, he, he, but he kept going on. He kept doing what God wanted him to do. He kept doing the work that God wanted him to do. He was faithful regardless of the results. Can you be faithful regardless of the, re of the results? <coughs> you know what results I'm talking about? What about that prayer you've been praying for for 15 years that hasn't been answered yet? Yeah. Can you be faithful? I didn't say that you would get the job done. Noah didn't save the world. Not everybody got on that ark, but man, he did what God told him to do. He was faithful regardless of whether the results ever came in, whether the numbers ever came in. And I'm telling you this, can you just be faithful regardless of whether God ever answers your prayer, whether God ever brings that, that dream to pass? Can you still be faithful knowing it's God's will for you to pray that way, knowing it's God's will for you to come to this church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night? It's God's will for you to read your Bible and to pray daily. Can you just be faithful in those things regardless of how everything else looks? Yeah. If you can, and if you have, and if you're trying to, I'm telling you, in God's eyes, you're faithful like Noah. You can be perfect, and your heart can be perfect. Right. Is this helping anybody? Is anybody yeah, getting amen. this? Amen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not trying to be a loving, gooey, anything like that. But I'm just trying to tell you, we have this false idea of what God expects of us. He obeyed God whether it made sense or looked successful. Yeah. He just did what God told him to do, whether it looked successful to the world or the brethren. Thirdly, he did what God told him to do, even though it was unorthodox and out of his comfort zone. He just kept doing what God told him to do, and God said, you're perfect. Let me give you this last one here. 
This is a three-part series, and I have ten pages of notes, but I'll just give you this last one, we'll go home. David was perfect, the Bible says. He, he, he fully followed the Lord. And that's another thing, it says he fully followed the Lord. You think a man throughout his whole life, no, he didn't, he messed up. But God says, no, he fully followed me. You're there in Philippians 3, aren't you in Philippians 3? I didn't read the verse I want to read to you. Look what Paul said about this. I'll show you one more person after this. That I may know him, verse number 10, Philippians 3, 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, but I were already perfect. He says, not as though I already were perfect. And you say, Aaron, that kind of throws a wrench on what you're saying about us being perfect now. If he says, I'm not perfect yet, but keep reading. But I follow after, that if I may apprehend that for which also I apprehended of Christ Jesus, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He hasn't apprehended it yet. He's not perfect yet. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Yeah. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Doesn't it sound there like Paul contradicted himself? Yeah. He said, I'm not perfect yet. I'm still trying to obtain it. And then he says, but as many of us as are perfect. Yeah. He says, we are perfect, but we're not perfect. <laughs> and some of you are looking at me like a Catholic and I've been getting, amen. <laughs> you know the Christian life's a paradox? Yeah. yeah. Christian life's a paradox. We can sorrow and heart over lost souls and yet have joy unspeakable and full of glory inside of our hearts. Amen. Bible say, he says it over there. He says, I know in whatsoever state I am there, uh, I am in there with to be content. And you know what Paul's saying is this? He's saying, there's a goal I'm reaching for, I'm, I'm shooting for. I want to perfect myself. I want to get better. I want to be more like Christ. I have not reached that state that I want yet. But at the same time, he was content. And he said, but we're perfect. I'm perfect. Paul wasn't cocky. He wasn't arrogant. And he's not telling you something that you can't achieve. He's saying that we are the church of Philippi. He's saying that this church here that was together, they were perfect. The Christian life is this idea, folks. You are always reaching forward to something. You are trying to be more like Christ. You're trying to you know, please the Lord more. You're trying to do things in your life to please Him more. But yet, at the same time, you should be able to step back and say, you know, I'm happy where I am with the Lord. Yeah. And folks, that's liberating. That is liberating whenever you can get to a place where you're content with your relationship with the Lord, where you know that He's pleased with you, and you know that you're being faithful to Him. Like, David, you know that you're faithful regardless of the results, like Noah was. That's liberating. Yes. Let me give you this last one here. Before I have you turn there, I promise I'll give it to you quick. I know you all are ready to get to Dairy Queen, even though it's 10 degrees outside, but uh, I'm just joking with you. I'm going to Dairy Queen, too. But if you had a Guess where the word perfect shows up? What Bible, what book of the Bible shows up the most in? What book would you guess? The word perfect. I'm going to trick you again. What? Well, the King James, yeah. But in the King James, which book? Which book? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, name a book, someone name a book. Which book would you think that word perfect shows up the most times in? Philippians. Philippians, not yeah. Philippians. Job? No. Who said Job? Me and. Did you guys listen to this message before? It's in the book of Job. Turn over to Job chapter number 1. Most people say Psalms, because it's the biggest book in the Bible, 150 chapters. And uh, it shows up in Psalms 12 times. Most people say Hebrews, the word perfect shows up a lot in Hebrews. Uh, it shows up in Hebrews 12 times. I'm not, I'm not going to get into why. Uh, those are two heavily Jewish books, and uh, the 12 has to do with the Jews. Um, but look over here at the book of Job. Look in Job chapter number 1, verse 1. I'm going to give you the third man that God said he was perfect. The third man that reached this expectation of this standard of perfection. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and skewed evil. Now I could apply it and say what made Job perfect in God's eyes was that he hated evil and upright, and, and that is true. Those are things that made him perfect. But there's more to Job that made him perfect than just that he hated the evil, he skewed evil, and he feared God, he was upright. There's more to it than just that. That does apply to us. You know how many times the word perfect shows up in the book of Job? Thirteen times. Thirteen is a number of rebellion in your Bible. I know Brother Frank taught on this. It's also a number of cursing. You see it a couple different times coming up when someone's being cursed. Uh, Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone hanging upon a tree. Three times it says it. 
Galatians 3.13, it has to do with rebellion and a cursing. Job is a book full of cursing. Where a man gets cursed. He has trouble after trouble after trouble come in his life. And it's the book that deals the most with perfection. You know that tells me in God's eyes, cursing and suffering has to do with perfection. And what you and I might think is a cursing in our life might just be what God's using to perfect us. Yeah. Suffering, chastisement, cursing, it's a method of perfecting. 2 Corinthians 12 says, My grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Hebrews 2.10, For it became of him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Hebrews 2.10. Perfection has to do with sufferings. Suffering and cursing. And I got to thinking about Job. Maybe you all have thought of this before, I don't know, but it, it hit me the other day. But a lot of times when I think of persecution because of you're being righteous. I think, you know, it, it's, it's because you're living righteous, so the Lord's going to persecute you because you did something bold for the Lord, and you know, you're a street preaching, and someone came up and punched you in the face, or you were knocking on doors, and someone threw, you know, slammed the door in your face, or punched you, or pushed you off their porch, or called the police on you, or something like that, or they're trying to sue you. I think of persecution in that regard. But you got to think about old Job. Job didn't know he's being persecuted. He didn't know he's being persecuted by the devil. I bet you to Job, it just looked like an unlucky hand was dealt to him in life. Yeah. I bet Job thought, why in the world is this stuff happening to me? He probably didn't associate it with his relationship with the Lord. He just probably thought, this is really unfair that this would happen to me and my family. He probably thought, my family shouldn't be this way. Lord, you must have the wrong idea. You must be thinking of somebody else. Why is all this stuff happening? He had no idea that it was actually happening because he was righteous in God's eyes. And that blessed me because of this. I think back to things in my life that I thought were just an unlucky hand that I was dealt. An unlucky hand, an unlucky hand of life that was dealt to me, just unlu unlucky circumstances or bad things happened in my life. And I realized all the time it may have just been God allowing the devil to curse me, allowing life to curse me, allowing the world to curse me because he was wanting to perfect things in my life. Yeah. And the reason why it's so valuable is this, folks. When you get to that place where you say, God... You get to that place where you say, overall, did I stay faithful in my life like David? Overall, my life, did I do what God, you told me to do, God, like Noah did? And I was faithful regardless of the results. I stuck with it. I stuck with it till the very end, regardless of how many came with me. Overall, if you try to do that, and secondly, if you can look back in your life at things that you don't like, <laughs> things that you thought were just a mistake, things that you thought had nothing to do with you being a Christian, things that you thought were just random, completely out there, and you can look back and say, Lord, that was perfect. Remember, you can get to that place of Christianity where those problems you thought you'd never get through or even look back with your gray hair on your head and say, man, God's been good. God's been good. I don't remember what I was worried about. But you can get to the place where you say, God, I realize now that all those things really did work together to good. And Lord, you, you find you accept me in your sight. Remember, you can get to that place or you really do believe all things work together for good, you're there. You're where Paul was. You're not trying to achieve something. You're not trying to be somebody. You're not trying to be the next apostle Paul. You're not trying to be a prophet or an evangelist or anything like that, a missionary. You're just being you. You're living. And whenever you get to heaven, you can say with Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Then you can be perfect in God's eyes. And you say, Aaron, well, I thought you were talking about you know, this high expectation of something that we couldn't reach. You no, know, that's the idea that you can reach that in God's eyes. Yeah. I think too many times, man, we put ourselves down, we put other people down, we, we don't realize that God, He's forgiving. Yeah. God understands, man. God understands that we're just, we're flesh and bones. And God just says, overall, are you trying to please me? Okay, I'll count it. You know, I got this ring here. It's uh, this one. This one's something funny, but this one, uh, this is a ring my wife got me for our wedding. I, I don't think she'll mind me saying this, but this ring, I don't know if you can see it, but it used to be gold. And it's not anymore. It's silver. Time, dirt, grease, dust, chemicals and gloves and hand-washing soap and everything else, it's turned this ring a different color than what it used to be. It doesn't shine the way it used to shine when it was all new. It doesn't, it doesn't look the way that it, it was supposed to look in the very beginning, but time is worn on this thing, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to glisten that it, that it used to. But I'll say this, this ring still sends the message that I wanted to send. Yeah. It still gets the job done. And I'll say this, it's perfect. Yeah. I don't want another one. I, 
haven't asked her to give me another ring. I'm happy with this one. You know God looks at you. You used to maybe have a shine about you, but you don't have it anymore. And time's worn on you. And sin and dirt has worn away a little bit at you. And God says, they're still sending the right message, though. Amen. They're getting the job done. They're perfect. I don't want another one. They're perfect. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank God for loving us. Lord, thank you for being good to us.